All right, let's should we, should we, should we like the joke? That? Yeah, let's do that again. Let's, <laughs> let's do that again. You come back up. <laughs> wow, that, that was wonderful, wasn't it? <laughs> right, right, right. That was great. We just got Rick rolled. Yeah. That's what it's called. That, it was popular in the 2000s when we were young. <laughs> Which, yeah, back in the day, back right? Back in the day. <laughs> well, great to see you all. Welcome. We are continuing our series, Decades, where uh, we've been looking at God's faithfulness through all generations. And uh, we've, uh, as you've noticed, the band is still up here. And we've been starting each uh, sermon off with a medley of worship songs from the decade that we are featuring. And our foundational verse for the entire series has been Psalm 11990, which says, Your faithfulness continues through all generations. And our goal has been to recount God's faithfulness through the decades, from the 70s to today. And as many of you by, um, and uh, that's because we, we've seen how God, he, he's aware of all that we're going to be facing. He knows it already. And so he, in his mercy, he prepares us for what's ahead of us. And, and we see that reflected in our worship. And, and every generation, really, every decade does have a different style of worship, a different, kind of a different feel to it, yeah, different sure. emphasis on the truth yeah. of who yeah. God is and what that means for us. So no matter where you intersect with our series, whether uh, you became a Christian before or a Christian after, uh, or maybe you were born after, uh, <laughs> we hope that you will see where, um, where these generations, these decades have influenced your faith and uh, have really uh, impacted the way that we worship. So uh, Ryan, we are now in the 2000s. Yeah. Uh, what was it like uh, almost 20 years now looking back at some of these old songs? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was awesome. It, it took me right back to, you know, high school and kind of leading worship in my small little youth group and, and playing with my brother and stuff. So, you know, it, it, it was kind of like a flashback a little bit, kind of reliving some high school memories and stuff. That's where I met my wife. And so, you know, it, it's, it's awesome. So it was great. Yeah. That's what I realized for me as I was thinking back about the 2000s, like what a decade of uh, milestones. For right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Ryan's got a, a series of uh, worship songs from the 2000s we're going to sing. Yeah. And uh, feel free to sing along. Yeah. It was hard to, um, just to, just to kind of share a little bit about this week in, in the 2000s. It was hard to select songs because <laughs> there's so many and there's still so many that we still sing. So I tried to, you know, pick as many as I possibly could that we, that we um, haven't sung in a long time, but um, are familiar. So uh, please sing along with us. Here we go. Yes, 
in itself is not what you have required. And you search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to you. Sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. You know the walk through the valley of the storms of this life. Your perfect love is casting. That was awesome. Yeah, let's give the band another round of applause. They worked extra hard to do that for us. Thank you. All right. So now that we've been Rick rolled, we've got our medley. Wow. Mighty to save, heart of worship. You never let go. Powerful songs. Uh, if you joined us at GVC to, uh, for worship at some point in the 2000s, you may have enjoyed a worship song featuring a trumpet solo, that would have been early 2000s, a guitar solo, or a banjo solo. I like to think we had a nice eclectic flair throughout the 2000s. The 2000s for Green Valley Church really was a time of steady growth. We were well established in the community of Westwood in Rancho Bernardo, we expanded our building at that time to include this incredible youth area that really fostered a love for dodgeball, I think, within our youth group that continues to this day. Nikki Morales joined our staff in 2000, or in the 2000s, and I came on board as well as our middle school pastor. And like I said earlier, the decades, uh, or the 2000s, was really a decade of milestones for me, high school graduation, college, career, and marriage. It was also a time of technological innovation. The way we listen to music, it, it changed with digital streaming. The way we communicated changed. MySpace, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, what we now call social media was just becoming popular. Blogging was added to Webster's Dictionary, I believe, in 2004. Everyone had flip phones and texting was building momentum. And not only could phones fit into your pocket at that time, but the iPhone was introduced in 2007, which sociologists look back, uh, they, they point that as a 
this introduction of the smartphone as a societal game changer. A lot of exciting changes going on. It was a time of hip hop, highlights, dark eyeliner, and reality TV. The expression of strong emotions was not only socially acceptable, it was becoming mainstream. And while the fears and anxiety of Y2K were certainly overhyped, a far more sinister evil was lurking in the shadows. Just one year into the new millennium, the shock and horror of the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, sent ripple effects across our nation and around the world, effects that still impact us to this day. The intended purpose of the attacks was to strike fear into the hearts of the American people. And that's exactly what it did. We proudly rallied as a nation, but the damage was done. The sense of safety and security many U.S. citizens had taken for granted was gone. And as you listen to and reflect on the popular songs, worship songs of the 2000s, you will sense a strong emotive theme mixed with declarations of God's faithfulness. Right? That's very much what we saw in the lyrics, and you kind of felt it as he sang. Strong mix of emotions coupled with declarations of God's faithfulness. The church began to rediscover the importance of engaging motion, emotions in worship, just like the psalmists of old. After all, our ability to experience, process, and express emotions is God-given. In many ways, the church of the 2000s wisely embraced this need. And so as, as society began exploring its emotions, and the American people were feeling angry and insecure from the terror of 9-11, the church provided a powerful way to direct those emotions to the God who cares and remains in control. The United States wasn't the only Western nation targeted by terrorists. On July 7, 2005, the London transportation system was also targeted, attacked by four suicide bombers. And for British worship leader and songwriter Matt Redman, that same week brought a deep personal loss for him and his wife through miscarriage. The, feeling the weight of the loss on a national level and for them as a personal level, they sat down and they started writing a song. And together they wrote the song, You Never Let Go, which we just ended with. It was a favorite worship song sung here at GVC and in churches around the world during the 2000s. It became an anthem for a generation. Now, the song is based on Psalm 23, verse 4, but you'll see it's got several other cross-references that uh, create these very powerful couplings of Scripture. The song opens with, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back. I know you are near. If you haven't already, go ahead and turn with me to Psalm 23. We're going to be focusing on just primarily one verse, Psalm 23, verse 4. So turn with me or scroll in your app to Psalm 23, verse 4. Some of you, it'll be a familiar verse for many of you. And some of you may even have it memorized. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalm 23 is one of the most loved and well-known passages in all of Scripture. And verse 4 just might be the most well-known verse of Psalm 23. It's universal appeal. It comes from the comfort that has been found by believers during their most difficult times in life. The truth of this ancient poem inspired by God and written by King David of Israel, has been put to the test for thousands of years. And it remains a timeless favorite 
for good reason. Part of which is the way that Psalm 23 is really a psalm of declaration. Just in verse 4 alone, you read, I walk, I will, you are, they comfort. And the entire psalm reads like this. Each line, a bold statement of profound truth about God and what that truth means for his followers. Verse 4, however, where we're picking up, it's a little concerning. Even though I walk through the darkest valley. Older translations often read, valley of the shadow of death. Yikes. Sometimes following God will mean walking through the valley of the shadow of death. It means that I will be tested. It means that I will be tested. As a follower of Jesus, you will be tested. Wait, why would I expect to be tested? Well, for one, we live in a fallen world, a world corrupted and damaged by sin, a world where innocent mistakes can have permanent consequences, a world of natural disasters, floods, earthquakes, and wildfires. During the 2000s, many of you know, we had wildfires that came through San Diego County uh, in 2003 and 2007. 2007 wildfires, when we were in Westwood, they went through uh, right across the street, essentially. Many of our people got reverse 911 calls in the middle of the night and had to evacuate without warning. Some lost their homes. It was an opportunity as a church to rally and to walk with each other for some through that valley, or that darkest valley. We also live in a world populated by sinful people. Our darkest valleys, they may be the result of our own sin and foolish choices, or they can be the direct result of somebody else's sin, pulling us into that darkest valley. We also live in a world deceived by God's enemy, Satan. The Bible talks plainly about a spiritual, Bible, or a spiritual battle that rages around us. We just don't always see it. When we experience difficulty, Satan, also called the accuser, sees it as an opportunity for temptation, an opportunity for moral compromise and to weaken faith. But from God's perspective, often that same situation is seen as a test of faith. An opportunity to trust. And in that trusting, develop spiritual growth and maturity. And that is what David experienced. And that's what he was writing about. So therefore, followers of Jesus can say, with a somber expectation, I will be tested. Moving on to the next part of verse 4. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. As surely as we can say, I will be tested, we can say, I will not fear. I will not fear. If I have faith in Jesus and I have God's love in me through his spirit, we know this because God is love. In fact, you could say that Psalm 23 is essentially a summary of what God's love looks like when, it comes, when it's expressed as care for his followers. And the result of the work of God's Spirit in the believer is love. And love is more powerful than fear. I mean, think about it. The only thing that motivates someone to action faster than fear is love. Going back to that, the first two lines of you never let go. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, which we already pointed out, that's a direct quote from Psalm 23, 4. But the following line, the second line, says your perfect love is casting out fear. 
a clear reference to 1 John 4.18, which reads, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out, or some versions casts out, fear. It's a powerful combination of verses. The more God's love fills my heart, the less room there will be for fear. That's what David experienced, and that's what God was reminding us through his words. Moving on to our next point, I will not fear because God will be there. I will not fear because God will be there. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. David knew God would be with him. God had promised throughout Scripture that he would. But David had also experienced God's presence again and again and again. If you're familiar with Psalm 23, you may have noticed that in the first half of the psalm, David was talking about God. He leads. But once David entered the darkest valley, he started talking directly to God. For you are with me. David knew from personal experience God's presence brings comfort to those who trust in him. Psalm 23 also starts with the famous line, The Lord is my shepherd. Many Bible scholars believe David wrote Psalm 23 later in his life when he was a king. And as he reminisced about his time as a shepherd, when he was younger, he also reflected about the dark and dire times and situations that God had led him through when he was a warrior. And in, in hindsight, David could clearly see the parallels between his God and a skilled shepherd. The rod and the staff, for example, were common tools of a skilled shepherd. The rod represented protection. Ancient shepherds would use a rod or a club to fight off predators who threatened the flock. The staff represented care and direction. A shepherd's staff was used to direct sheep down the right path or to pull them back from danger. You Never Let Go uses one more powerful coupling of verses I want to point out. This time, Psalm 23.4 and Psalm 27.1. Tom, uh, Psalm 27.1, it says this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And in the song, we read, And if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? In other words, no matter what you face, or no matter who you're facing, God will be there. When asked about the personal significance of you never let go, Redmond said this, There are times in life when everything in life seems to be breaking and shaking apart. And that age-old psalmist cry of, How long, O Lord, how long, is echoing through your soul. The song for us, talking about he and his wife, the song for us was really a way of reminding ourselves that there is a God who never lets go of us through the times of calm and the stormy times. The church of the 2000s it gave us an emotional depth and a somber resiliency to our worship and our faith. Two qualities of faith that we would need for the decades to come. The emotional depth and somber resiliency I'm talking about are captured in the last lines of our song that we've been examining. I can see the light that is coming for the heart that holds on. There will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, Still I will praise you, still I will praise you. That resiliency, not neglecting emotion, 
but bringing it in and coupling it with the power and sovereignty and reliability of God. Because God's got me in his grip, I can trust him. I will be tested, but I will not be afraid. In the, two, the 2000s, they came to a harsh close with the Great Recession. Rough start and a harsh close. It's a painful reminder that each decade has more than its fair share of hardships. Each decade is an opportunity for the Christian to declare, I will be tested. I will not fear. God will be there. Each decade is an opportunity for the church to declare, we will be tested we will not fear. God will be there. While the truth of the lyrics from You Never Let Go are timeless, eventually the song's popularity faded away. Matt Redman would go on to write other worship songs that would actually overshadow the success of You Never Let Go, winning him multiple Grammy Awards. Some of those songs we'll likely sing next week in the, two, in the 2010s. In the 2010s, Green Valley Church would unexpectedly need to find a new location to call home. But you'll have to come back for that story. For now, after the service in the lobby, you'll find uh, the poster boards that we've been uh, filling out and writing on, sharing times of God's faithfulness. Or if you, uh, if you became a believer, make sure you write that down on that decade and put your name. I know I've been greatly encouraged reading the stories of faith and God's faithfulness on those boards. And so just like the weeks before, we'll have, a, 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 we've got poster boards there for God's faithfulness in the 2000s, opportunities for you to, to write something there of God's faithfulness. And uh, some of you may have been a little young to remember much from the 2000s. If that's you, you can write down something that you know of uh, God's faithfulness to your family or wait until uh, next week when we get a little bit closer to today. The Lord gave his church songs in the 2000s. And in Psalm 98, one, we are reminded to sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. He did that for believers thousands of years ago, he did that for believers in the, 20, in the 2000s, and he's doing that for believers today. And so, uh, in light of this, that we are to sing a new song to the Lord, we, uh, I'm going to pray for, pray for us, and then the band's going to come back out, and we're going to finish with a current worship song. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for being a God that is always there. You are always available. Whenever we are walking through the darkest valley or the highest mountain, Lord, you are always there with us every step of the way. I pray that you would help us to follow your lead in our lives. I pray that you would help us to follow your lead as a church. Pray that, you would, that your love would be casting out the fear that may be growing in our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us for the paths ahead. That you would be using us to make a difference in this world. That you would use us to encourage and to strengthen those around us. That when things are difficult, Lord, that you would remind us to turn to you and to trust you and to lean into your goodness and your strength and your sovereignty. Pray that when we're feeling overwhelmed by emotions, that it would be you that would calm our hearts and fill us with your peace. Lord, we offer these gifts to you. We offer our lives. We offer these gifts and this giving. We pray that you would use it to 
bless our church, to bless our community, to continue doing the good work that you've called us to do. Lord, we love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Trusting God. 